Hi everyone and welcome to the second video on the Object Oriented Programming Fundamentals Playlist. I hope you guys don't mind too much if I exercise just a little bit of my passion for grand strategy games like the one you can see around me here. This is Stellaris because these types of games lend themselves very nicely for us to examine what it means to be working with objects in an object oriented paradigm. So I will see you in the next part of this video. So in this video, we are going to be learning a little bit more about classes, objects and instances and touching upon attributes, methods and constructors. And of course, in the classroom and with our coding practice and in future videos, we are going to be continually addressing and practicing what these six concepts mean. Now, you may have noticed already, guys, that in the object oriented programming paradigm, this particular space is full of its own quirky terminology. And what I'm quite keen to do initially is to stick with terminology, which you guys are already familiar with in the procedural programming paradigm, concepts such as subroutines with functions and procedures and variables. And then at an opportune moment, I'll switch the terminology across to the world of object oriented programming. So bearing in mind that it almost seems to be an obligation that when it comes to classes, objects and instances, one has to choose a cat, a dog or a bird as an example of how we create objects from classes and then to talk about inheritance. I'm probably guilty of this in the classroom as well, but in the videos, I thought I would do something a little bit different. And as you may have gleaned in the earlier parts of the video, quite keen to explore some examples of computer games, which lend themselves very nicely to talking about uh, the six concepts that you see on the slide. And the one that I would like to explore in a little bit more detail with you is Stellaris. Now Stellaris is a grand strategy game published by Paradox, who specialize in grand strategy games. And Stellaris is a sci-fi empire building game. Um, and as I said earlier, it's ideally suited to exploring object oriented programming and that particular paradigm. Now I'm not a Stellaris developer, obviously, uh, this was written in C++. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to simplify, grotesquely simplify Stellaris and use it as an example of how we might be creating classes and then from those instantiating objects. More on those concepts, obviously, a little bit later on in the video. But to, uh, to introduce Stellaris, it's essentially a game where at the outset, you and of course your AI opponents get to choose a particular species which you role play in the game. So before we move on, don't be put off if you are not a big player of computer games, because I'm sure you're familiar with the idea that in computer games, we have individual characters or avatars, each of which has a particular role to play in the game. They may share similarities, but typically they will operate or function within the game independently of each other. And each will have a role to play in the story that's being told in the game. So when we start a new game of Stellaris, we are given a race, which is an example of the species that we have chosen, and we are given a single populated planet. So in this particular case, the race of aquatic species that we have is called the Heliana race, and they are occupying a single populated planet called Hearth Sea. And this is just a snapshot you can see on the screen of numerous characters which are created at the beginning of the game, which occupy jobs on the planet surface. There are lots of these jobs and I've just selected three of them that you can see on the screen. We have four farmers, we have four miners and we have four technicians. So how can we best describe our characters on the planet surface, our population of farmers and miners and technicians in terms of the object oriented paradigm? Well, on this slide, you may notice that the miners and farmers can be described in terms of two key components. The first are a set of characteristics and properties, which are actually variables which are being assigned values. And secondly, we have a set of functions which enables our characters to do things. So, for example, to produce minerals, to join factions, to raise crime, to consume goods. We describe those typically in the object oriented paradigm as behaviors. So let's have a look 
at the next slide and examine this in a little bit more detail. So using a farmer in the game as an example, each character or avatar on the planet's surface has been created from a blueprint or a template which we call a class in the object oriented paradigm. Each character or avatar is referred to as an object. So in the previous uh, video, you may remember when we talked about businesses, we talked about systems and entities and discrete entities. In the world of object oriented programming, we refer to these discrete entities as objects. An object is also referred to as an instance of a class. Different way of saying the same thing. An object is also called an instance of a class. Each of our characters or avatars in Stellaris has specific characteristics. And if you look at the example of our farmer on the slide, you will see that this is actually data that's assigned to variables and also what we refer to as behavior. And again, you guys will uh, see straight away that what we refer to as behavior are essentially, uh, essentially subroutines, functions or procedures. So we can imagine Stellaris characters as objects with characteristics and properties uh, such as the example given here. And these are essentially variables with values. We can also think of the behaviors of one of our particular characters as being subroutines. And you can spot those, as I mentioned earlier, you can spot those straight away because they have the opening and closing brackets. Now, one very important distinction to be made with you guys at uh, GCSE using Python programming is that in the object oriented paradigm, we don't refer or distinguish subroutines as either procedures or functions. Quite simply, subroutines are the same thing as functions. And we say that a function either returns a value to the main program or it doesn't return a value. We don't use the term procedure to distinguish between the two. So essentially all of these are referred to as functions regardless of whether they return values to the main program or not. So what might a class look like? This would be the template or the blueprints from which our farmers, our miners, and our technicians and other characters on the planet's surface are created from. Well, on the slide, you can see an example of what the aquatic class might look like. I'm gonna repeat some of the definitions you saw in the previous slide, and I think it's useful to do that. So we can say a class is a blueprint or a template for an object. We've previously referred to an object as the characters or avatars in our game. When we create an object from a class, we say that we instantiate the class. An object is an instance of a class. These are the same thing. An object is the same as an instance of a class. A class is said to compromise state and behavior. Now, if you have a look on the example here, you can see that we have variables, but they have yet to be assigned values. And the values become meaningful when we create an object and then each of those values become meaningful for the object that we've created. So when we have variables that have been declared, but not necessarily initialized, we call that collective the state of our class. When we instantiate a class, we then have to, the opportunity to initialize the instance or the object with values or variables specific to that specific instance. So for example, we might want to create an object that's a minor and we might want to, ass uh, to assign the housing needs of one. Alternatively, we might want to create an object and call that a farmer and then set housing needs to two. And it depends on the circumstances and of course, the nature of the objects, the characteristics of the objects that we're creating. So remember in the previous slide, that we have two key components for a class from which we create the object. We have the characteristics and we have the behaviors. The characteristics, and these are the variables, and they're the same for all instances created from that class. These variables may or may not have initial values of data assigned to them. The variables declared in a class are referred to as the state of the class. When a class is instantiated, we can then assign specific values of data to these variables if we choose to do so. Now the behaviors or the functionality, these are functions that are the same for all of the objects that are instantiated from the same class. So to take this a stage further, you can see in the center of the slide, we have an example of the class or what we're imagining the Stellaris class to look like. This is the class from which we create objects, we instantiate 
for all of the characters on the surface of our planet and they are of course adopting different roles farmers miners um, and uh, technicians for example so let's imagine that we instantiate the aquatic class four times to create four unique objects so four unique characters uh, in the game and these are going to fulfill the job role of miners on the planet as opposed to farmers or technicians so we have four miners miner number one miner number two miner number three and miner number four now each object has its own completely encapsulated data values and functions that act on the data encapsulation means that the data and functionality of each object exists independently of the other objects so the way to think about this although it's not entirely correct but it's okay to think about each of our uh, characters our objects in the game as having their own copy of the variables and their own copy of the functions so for minor 2 as an example we could change the crime variable to 2.1 and then call the join faction function to get minor number 2 to join a faction on the planet's surface and whilst we're doing that at the same time we could change the crime variable for minor number 3 to 0.4 and call the adopt role function so you can see here that the values of variables and the functions that we make use of are independent of each other. Each minor, uh, each character, each object in the game has their own independent set of data and functionality. And this is really, really important in object oriented programming. So you remember earlier on in the video, I said that I was going to stick with terminology which you guys are already familiar with from your time spent programming in the procedural programming paradigm words like variable subroutines and functions and i've been doing that to date and i also mentioned that at an appropriate time i would change the terminology to make it more object oriented specific now there's a reason that i've done that because the world of object oriented programming can get quite complicated pretty quickly and we need to talk about variables and functions in particular in a little bit more detail. Now you can see on the slide here that I have changed the name variables to attributes and I have changed the name functions to methods. And at least for the time being, this is the terminology which I'm going to use. So for variables, we now call these attributes and for functions, we now call these methods. Now I'm going to keep it simple and I'm going to make an assumption here which is not entirely correct but it will do at this stage of your knowledge and experience with object oriented programming and the OOP paradigm. We're going to say for the time being that all variables, the ones that uh, you've been looking at in the slides so far, are attributes and all examples of functions are methods. So why are we doing this well for encapsulation to work so for objects to be able to function independently of each other and to keep their own data intact python and of course other object oriented programming languages needs to be able to manage multiple copies of functions and multiple copies of variables across many different objects and you saw an example of how objects um, behave independently of each other when we were talking about uh, minor two and minor number three. Now the mechanic under the bonnet for this to work is called binding. So each variable and its assigned value and each function is going to be specific to the object that contains them. This is so that Python can manage and keep track of all of the different functions and all of the different values associated with variables. We say that a variable is bound to the object that contains it and that a function needs to be bound to the object that contains it as well. Now the need for variables and functions to be bound to an instance of the class is actually established at the class level. So if we go back to this slide very briefly, if we take this template, there we go, if we take this template we have the variables which we're now calling attributes in place, they've been um, specified here and we also have uh, the functions which are now calling methods specified here as well. Now what happens is that when we create an instance, for example minor one, we create an object or an instance of this class, the variables become bound to this particular object. The functions also become bound to this particular object. Now when we have binding in place we need to change the term from variable to attribute 
and from function to method. Likewise, let me just get rid of those boxes. There we go. Likewise, when we create an object from the class and we call that minor two, the variables which we had defined um, and declared in our class are now bound to this particular instance, which is minor two. And the functions that have been created when we instantiated are bound to this particular instance, minor number two. Now, when we have binding in place, we refer to the variables as attributes and refer to the functions as methods. So let's go back to our slide that we were looking at. So binding does not exist in procedural ob uh, oriented programming. This is something which is completely new for you. However, variables and functions do. So we need to distinguish between how we use these in the two different paradigms. Now, what we say, I'm, I've put some um, um, definitions up for you on this slide. What we say is that an attribute is a special type of variable used in object oriented programming that is bound to the object that contains it. Likewise, a method in object oriented programming is a special type of function that is bound to the object that contains it. Now, as mentioned earlier, we don't have this concept in procedural oriented programming. We call them functions and uh, variables. They, they're not bound to a particular part of the program. In object oriented programming, this is something that we do. So we use a different terminology for the fact that we have binding in place. Variables, variables become attributes and methods, uh, sorry, uh, functions become methods. Now, for the moment, as I said, we're going to assume that uh, all of the variables that you come across in uh, the object oriented paradigm are called attributes and all of the functions that you come across in the object oriented paradigm are called methods. Now, this isn't entirely true. And uh, certainly in the other playlists, when we look at object oriented coding in a little bit more detail, you'll see both examples of attributes and methods and variables and functions. But for the time being, it's let's keep this really, really simple and make the assumption that all variables become uh, attributes and all functions become methods. So guys, now I suspect is a good time to take a little bit of a breather because both in the classroom and on this playlist, we've covered quite a bit of theory, which is very, very new for you. And I know from experience that this can feel a little bit overwhelming at times for some students. It certainly may well take you out of your comfort zone with the type of programming that you've been used to since Key Stage 3. This is why I am very, very keen that you guys should practice some object-oriented programming. We're going to do that for the first time in the next part of this video. I would very much encourage you right now to open up Python Idle or Python uh, or PyCharm and to follow along with the coded examples which I do in this video. Pause the video if you need to, spend some time looking at the code and relating the code to the theory that you've learned so far. By practicing the coding, it helps to make sense of the theory and it builds your confidence with both the theory and the practical programming components. So with that in mind, I will see you in the next part of this video. Welcome to the practical uh, programming part of the video. And you can see in the purple doc string on the screen, I've written example of a class, instantiation, attributes, methods, and a constructor. That's what we're going to cover in our particular example of code. Now the constructor, I haven't covered or addressed this earlier on in the video. And the reason for that is because I think it's actually easier for you guys to understand what a constructor is if I actually code one rather than trying to explain it. So that's what I'm going to do. And that's why I have left it until this part of the video to talk about the constructor. Okay, let's crack on and write some code. So guys, either uh, just watch and then pause the video and copy the code or uh, copy along with me. Either way, I'm going to write the code first. I might make some comments uh, as I'm going along, but I will explain the code in full once I've written it and once I've created some um, instances, some objects. So we're going to stick with the theme that we had earlier. We're going to stick with the Stellaris theme. I'm going to create a class called Aquatic, and then I'm going to create some characters. In other words, I'm going to instantiate and create some objects, and they will be um, characters who are doing the mining job as opposed to the technician or the farming job. So these will be examples of miners. So we're going to start off with creating our class. I'm going to put aquatic because that's the name of our class and confirming that it's an object. Then we need to do def. All of this will become clear later, guys, when I explain the code. And we're going to do self. Um, actually, let's pass in some parameters. So let's do name 
uh, let's do age and job. Okay, so we want self dot name equals name, and then we want self dot age is going to equal age self dot. So a nice little challenge for you guys whilst I'm uh, coding uh, this is to see if you can figure out the significance of the syntax that I'm actually using here and assigning these values. Uh, so self dot job is going to equal job. There we go. Okay, and one more. I'm going to do self dot production because I think this will be useful. Starts off as zero. So this is units of production. Um, let's create a method. So let's do method produce. This will be one of the many methods that you saw earlier. We used to call them functions, if you remember, associated with our characters. I'm just going to stick with one. So we're going to do um, a method called produce. Let's print out. Okay, I am busy with my job as a and let's put plus self dot job we're going to increase production so we're going to say self dot production becomes self dot production plus 20 units and let's do another print statement and let's do um, I have now produced and then we want um, plus and then we want the string version of self dot production and then at the end of that we just move over the editor boundary a little bit there and then we want plus and then I'm going to say units okay we've got an extra bracket in there for some reason now I'm just going to put a couple of extra print statements in here just to make it easier to understand what's happening in this particular part of the code. So let's pop in here print constructor called. So you can probably guess by now that uh, this bit of code is the constructor. And then here I'm going to put print uh, attributes attributes initialized nitty outlized okay right let me just check this we've got our class we've got our constructor we're assigning attributes with values we've initialized then we have got i'm just going to put in here comments that says method okay so uh, when we call produce print i am busy with my job as self.job which is a string data type so that's fine self.production equals self.production plus 20 i have now produced string version of self dot production plus units fantastic okay so let's do some instantiation so we need a name for our first character our first object so we're going to say character one equals and then we want aquatic we're going to feed in some values um, so let's do what name age and job so let's do name Helena uh, we want job uh, no we don't we want age let's say 30 and then we want a job which is minor okay and let's do another character let's do uh, character 2 and we're going to say equals Peter not very alien sounding names guys I have to admit 35 minor okay so let's uh, see what we get when we run the code we do have some print statements in here so we should get some feedback so let's run it and see what we get let's just move this over for you guys okay so you can see here it says instructor called attributes initialized constructor called attributes initialized so that relates to this area of code here and you can see of course the reason it's printed twice is because we have created two instances two objects so each time we have instantiated from our class aquatic okay this part of the code has been run on each occasion now let's see what happens if we call this particular method and we get our characters to actually do some work so i'm going to do character one 
okay dots in fact before I do that let's make it clear what these characters names are so I'm going to put in here print this is because I now have two objects so it'd be useful to see which one has what name so I'm going to put in um, let's do my name is okay and then let's do plus and then we want self dot name okay that will be useful right so let's do character one dot produce there we go and let's do character two dot produce okay character two dot produce so let's see what we get when we run our code okay so let's take a little bit of time uh, just to go through this we've got constructor called and initialized attributes constructor called and initialized attributes okay so that's done for um, running our code initially then we've actually asked our uh, objects to do some some work to be functional so we've done character one dot produce and that says my name is Helena I am busy with my job as a miner I've now produced 20 units uh, character two dot produce my name is Peter I am busy with my job as a miner I have now produced 20 units <clears throat> So before I jump in to the code in depth and tell you what's happening, I'm going to put some additional comments in because I think it would help. And I'm going to use the doc string format for that, which is the triple quotes. So let's pop that in here. And I have said the constructor, let me just zoom in. The constructor serves two purposes. It helps to manage memory for each instance created from this class. And for each instance created from this class initializes Let's put in there initializes the attributes okay so every object oriented programming language has a constructor uh, the syntax can vary the exact mechanics that happens underneath the bonnet can vary as well but in essence to one degree or other there is some memory management or helping uh, to manage memory that's needed each time an instance is created so each time an instance is created the uh, your computer needs to allocate space in memory for that to happen and secondly each time we instantiate from the class we need to be able or, or at least we need to offer the possibility of initializing our attributes so in python the syntax for the constructor looks like this so let me just pop in a box so that i can show you okay it's def and then we have double underscore with init this is sometimes referred to as dunder init and dunder is shorthand for double underscore so dunder init so if you hear programmers or you read on the internet dunder init you'll know that that is the constructor or the syntax for the constructor so in python init obviously stands for initialization rather than uh, constructor but it serves the so same purpose now in here of course you will recognize um, from this the def keyword is used for defining a function so the syntax is very similar it's just that this isn't a function it's a method and it's a special type of method called the constructor you'll also notice that we have the keyword self and I'll come back to self in a minute but the thing which I'm going to look at for the moment are these parameters name age and job so earlier on in the video you will remember that uh, when I actually created our two objects our instances these were values which I passed to our uh, constructor. So if we pop down and have a look, um, just to refresh your memory, you can see character one equals aquatic. So character one is a new instance of the aquatic class. And here I'm passing in values, just like you guys do when you create functions in the procedural object, uh, sorry, the procedural oriented uh, paradigm exactly the same type of syntax so if you think of this as just being a function call then we're calling our function and we're passing in these parameters just as we always have done and we did the same thing for character two as well we provided the name the age and the job description so in <clears throat> in a gaming environment of course it w it's not the user that provides that using text code that we've got here this is probably created from somewhere else in the program um, with uh, different uh, instances, different parts of our um, game communicating with other parts of our game. So 
let's just get rid of this box a little bit and let's just move this up okay so back to our constructor then and our syntax which is using um, dunder init or double underscore init so here we receive the name the age and the job which you saw earlier when we created the instance but in addition we have the keyword self and you will have noticed that self pops up all over the place so what is self doing well again every object oriented programming language has something similar the name might be slightly different but the concept is exactly the same the keyword self is telling python that this is um, a method in this particular case which is bound to the instance that's created and is using it so self is what tells python that this isn't an ordinary function this is a method and it needs to bind this particular function to the instance that uses it and we call that of course a method so wherever you see self you'll know that python is being told to do binding to bind the method or the attribute to the instance that's created so we can see another um, use of self down here if i just get rid of these boxes a little bit there we go <coughs> so we can see more examples of using the keyword self here because each one of our attributes has got the self keyword at the front so let me just pop a box around those so that you can see so what's actually happening here is that the value of name is passed in using an ordinary variable because you've seen this done before uh, in key stage four when you were writing functions so this is our input parameter this has a value so um, when it was character one it was helena helena is passed into this function which of course we call a method that's the value there we then say to python take that value which has been passed in called helena okay and assign it to an attribute and use self we use self to tell python that this is an attribute and the value name uh, or the um, the uh, uh, label name needs to be bound to any instance that's created from this class same with age job and production so down here you can see a similar use of the keyword self let me just pop a box around this too with our method called produce again our syntax is very similar to a function we have def at the front um, but we have the keyword self in here as well so what does this actually mean because the keyword self is there on its own well if i took the keyword self out from here and removed it what we would then have is essentially a standard function and python would treat this as a function without being bound to anything at all the fact that it has self in once again it tells python that this is a method and not a function and it needs to be bound to the instance that contains it however you may have noticed that whilst self is contained in the brackets as a parameter when we actually came to use or call the uh, method produce down here there was no mention of self in other words this is parameter here is not actually used when we come uh, to call uh, the method and in fact it was the same here with um, when we came to instantiate our characters and call the constructor you can see here that we have three input parameters but actually if we go back and have a look at the constructor itself you can see that it actually has four parameters as well because if we include self we have four parameters so the question then is why do we not need to include self when we actually make use of these special functions called method on both occasions you can see that we've used uh, the constructor and the produce um, method but we haven't included the fact that self is contained um, as part of the parameters well the reason for that actually is because python does it for you if it knows that self is included in the parameter for method it doesn't ask you to include self it does it itself um, pardon the pun so whenever we call uh, let's just get rid of the boxes again whenever we call um, a method because it's bound uh, to the uh, to the instance python knows if we go down here okay because we've actually included self in the definition of our method here python knows that when we call it it can actually include self itself so it doesn't ask us to do this 
okay we're not required to put in self here we're not required to put in anything at all just the customized parameters that we've chosen to pass through but we never need to make reference to the fact that this should be self so that it's picked up here at the top so there's a couple more things which i would like to demonstrate for you the first one is the notion of a method in a class returning a value because you you remember earlier on i said that we don't use the term procedure anymore but we do have functions that may or may not return a value to the main program and of course now we're talking about methods instead of functions regardless i've got two functions here and don't forget that the constructor is actually a special type of method which is called first when we create an instance of a class but neither of these two methods are returning a value back to a calling part of the program so what i'd like to do is to show you how that might work and the other thing which i'd like to show you which is basically um, setting us up for the next video where we're going to look at private public and protected attributes is to show you the syntax for being able to access the attributes of a particular instance so what we're going to do then is we're going to create another attribute for our character for our object called happiness and uh, again you guys that are used to gaming i'm sure will be used to this idea that happiness is a modifier in a game and changes can change what a character does um, based on how fulfilled they are during the storytelling so let's do this now what i'm going to do is i'm going to create a new method and let's do that here so we're going to call um create a method called uh, let's say gen happiness and i don't know if you saw this before but python actually by default adds in self and it is making the assumption just like i did earlier on that if you're going to use variables and functions in a class they're likely to be attributes and methods because we're going to want to use binding so Python actually assumes that we're going to want a special type of function called a method and it's going to need to be bound. So uh, let's just confirm that with a comment that says method because it is indeed a method. So we're going to generate a random number in order to uh, provide our character with a happiness value. So let's do that. We want to um, say from and then we want random import we have seen this guys before many times we want randint and what we're going to do is we're going to return the random number okay and we want to return a happiness value between let's say um 30 and 100 uh, back to the part of the program that calls it so basically if we have a character with a happiness of 30 they're basically measurable and if we have a character with a happiness of 100, they're unusually ecstatic. Um, so where are we going to return this value to? Well, actually, we're going to create uh, or initialize the happiness attribute back up in our constructor. But to do that, I'm actually going to use the return value from our method. So let's do that now. I'm going to pop in here self dot and then we want happiness. And that will be equal to the return value from the method called self.genhappiness. There we go. So in actual fact, within the constructor, we can actually include some quite complicated and lengthy code if we wanted to do that. So we can actually access and use methods inside uh, the class itself as part of the initialization process. So we're going to create a value of happiness based on the random number generator which is returned a value of which is returned from the method okay so we need to check that that works okay so we need down here to access the attribute happiness now we haven't done that so far because what we've done is we've uh, created our objects and then we've um, called um, a method but we haven't actually accessed any of our attributes and we simply do that using the same dot notation so if i did character one dot you can see here that in PyCharm, it gives me access to all of the attributes. You can see here, happiness, name, job, and age. So it's just a dot happiness uh, will give us the value that we want. So if you guys are wondering why it is, it doesn't look like this, dot self dot happiness. 
That's because the keyword self is only really relevant to trigger the mechanics inside the class. We don't need to reference that outside the class or the instance itself. So it's just character one dot happiness will do the job for us. So um, let's do the same for character two. we go character two dot happiness as well. Okay, let's see if this works. Let's see what values we get. Let's move this over for you. It's taking a little while to run these days, actually. There we go. Okay, so um, did I not do that correctly? Let's have a quick look at the bottom. Oh, we didn't. I didn't print. Silly me. I should have wrapped that around in the print function. So let's do that. Okay, that's because we didn't print it out. Daft. Okay, let's run it again. There we go. Okay, so it looks like Helena, which is our first character, character one, has a happiness of 85. Peter, not so happy with the happiness of 57. Let's actually do something useful with these happiness figures. So in produce, rather than having both of our workers producing the same, even though they have variations in happiness, let's put a condition in here. So at the top, uh, let's just get rid of that. At the top here, I'm going to put um, an if statement. So I'm going to say if self dot and then self dot happiness is less. so if self dot happiness is less than or equal to 20 to 75 then we don't have a happy worker so i'm going to print uh let's do um i am not a happy worker therefore not producing as much so we're going to change our production uh, increments and we're going to say, let's copy this line of code because it's going to be almost the same bar at the end bit. So let's do self-production, self-production plus 10. Else, back to normal with a happy worker. Okay, so let's just uh, indent that and we'll put an extra print statement in here. Let's copy this. Okay, pop that in. I am a very happy worker. There we go. So let's just check this. Uh, if self happiness is less than 75, okay, else you'd, okay, that looks cool. Uh, so let's run this and uh, see what we get. Taking its time again, actually. Okay, so my name is Helena. I'm busy with my job as a miner. I'm not a happy worker. Okay, let's just zoom in a bit more guys because I can afford to do that. Okay, there we go. My name is Helena. I'm I'm a busy with my job as a miner. I'm not a happy worker. I've now produced 10 units. Okay, my name is Peter. I'm not a happy worker. I've now produced 10 units as well. Let's run this again and see if we can get a happy worker from these two guys. There we go. Oh, that's better. Oh, we've got two happy workers now. Let's just zoom in. Okay, my name is Helena. I'm a, a busy with my job. I'm a very happy worker. I produce 20 units. My name is Peter. This guy's happy as well. Okay, um, so two things to demonstrate then. One is a method which returns a value to the main program and we uh, exploited the constructor in order to, uh, to get that value uh, back from the method. And also the ability to be able to access any attributes using the dot notation. So in this case, character one, dot happiness but of course equally I could have accessed any of the attributes if I just show you how that works in PyCharm happiness name job and age okay now having looked at this syntax here let's just put happiness back in the next video when we do our coding challenge uh, sorry our coding demo I'm going to explain to you the difference between private, public and protected attributes. And this is a very, very important aspect of your theory, which I'm going to demonstrate for you uh, using Python, um, because I can almost guarantee if you do get an object oriented piece of code to interpret in your written exam, it will ask you why certain attributes are flagged as being private and public. And certainly in this case here, you might have guessed that if we're able to access attributes directly then that means that by default our attributes are public they are accessible outside the instance that's been created 
So I will see you in the next video.